Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Tiffany Cherry. I'm an ambassador for Our Watch, a national leader in Australia's work to prevent violence against women. I'm your facilitator for this online event, Our Watch's forum on recognising non-physical forms of violence. We're doing this now because Our Watch has launched an updated campaign, No Excuse for Abuse, following reports of a rise in domestic violence during the COVID-19 lockdown. For today's Q&A discussion, I'll be joined by Our Watch Chair Natasha Stott Despoia and my fellow Our Watch Ambassadors Khadija Bla, Rebecca Polson and Tarang Chola. Welcome to you all. Hello. We are meeting today online, but we are coming to you from our homes across Australia and would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the country throughout Australia. I'm on the traditional lands of the Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation and my colleagues are on the lands of Natasha. I'm on the land of the Ghana people. And uh, Rebecca? Darug people. Khadija? Ghana land. And Tarang? Wurundjeri land. We recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture and that sovereignty was never ceded. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. On behalf of all of us, I continue by saying that we hope you are all safe and well during this incredibly trying time. This discussion will deal with the subject and experience of physical and non-physical violence. If you or someone you know is experiencing any kind of abuse, please contact 1800 RESPECT. If you're worried about your own behavior, please contact Men's Line. And of course, if you, a child or another person is in immediate danger, please dial triple zero. All of these services are available 24 seven and links will be available in the description of this video. So Natasha, I'll start with you. Our Watch launched a new look, No Excuse for Abuse uh, campaign last week. Why now? Well, in this particularly difficult time for so many Australians, we're dealing with some tragic uh, health and of course, economic consequences of this pandemic. But one of the most heartbreaking and concerning uh, consequences has been an increase in domestic and family violence and indeed sexual assault. This campaign that we've launched is about educating Australians about the different types of abuse. We talk about physical violence, but there are other controlling, uh, coercive and other abusive forms that we need to be aware of, whether that's technological, social, emotional, spiritual, financial abuse, for example. But all of these uh, can spike in a crisis. And can I just make clear that just because tension and stress uh, can exacerbate existing violence at a time like this. It doesn't excuse it. You mentioned a key word there, the campaign so powerful simply through the messaging, there is no because. If you say, but it's only because, obviously you are condoning violence. Why is challenging the condoning of violence so important? Well, first of all, we need to understand the different types of abuse and violence in order to prevent it in the first place. But of course, there is no excuse for violence of any kind. And we can't allow, condone, trivialise, minimise any form of abuse or violence. And that's why, again, it's so important that people can recognise the signs of abuse. So often we think in terms of people snapping and uh, violence being a physical form, but there are many other techniques that are used in order to control often women and children. And as I say, they can include controlling your finances, using technology to monitor or stalk you, using emotional abuse, so put downs that are absolutely debilitating, even social uh, techniques of abuse, telling you what to wear, who you can see. Once you start to recognize this controlling behavior, you can identify how you can stop it, you can get away from it, and of course, as a society, we can start to prevent it. Uh, even the presumption or the, or the acceptance of a spike in violence during lockdown condones violence. How can we educate the wider public on the very simple and important fact, any violence anywhere and any time is not okay? Well, campaigns such as No Excuse for Abuse makes clear not only to individuals who may be at risk of violence or experiencing violence or at risk of perpetrating violence, but to the broader community. You know, we want to explain to those people how to get help, how to recognise signs of violence, but we want the broader community to be good bystanders, to 
intervene when it's safe to do so, to call out sexist or harassment or any forms of behaviour that are not appropriate. If we can educate each other about what constitutes violence or abuse, we get further towards preventing it. And certainly we must never condone, never trivialise, never minimise and certainly never excuse any form of violence, especially gendered violence. Mm, thank you, Natasha. Khadija, the campaign's purpose is, of course, to raise awareness of non-physical forms of abuse. Natasha's touched on it. What other forms of abuse are there? And are there forms of abuse that you're particularly concerned about at this time? Oh, thank you. Um, yes, I think, you know, we have emotional abuse, which I think in our society, we tend to focus on the fact that if somebody doesn't hit their partner, there's still this assumption then that it's not really abuse or that physical abuse is the most important type. It's the hardest type. It's the most painful type. We have assumptions around this and that's actually not true at all. What we're seeing with research is actually that emotional abuse is so damning because mostly what it does is that it gaslights the victim. It makes you feel like you're alone and you're the only one who can see it because those perpetrators are good and be nice to everyone else except the actual chosen victim because it's a choice. They're choosing their victim. They're choosing who they behave that way to. And because you're alone in the put downs and the, the gaslighting and the question, making you feel like you're going crazy and you're imagining things, nobody else can see it. And it usually is what makes women feel so alone because it's your word versus their word that this is happening to you. Emotional abuse is, it, 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 this cars are not physical. They're deep inside and they're lifelong. And then, you know, we talk about financial abuse, having your money being controlled. I know women who, when they get their paycheck, it doesn't go into their account. I know women who have to show receipts for everything they buy, including tampon or buying nappies for their babies. I know women who have never seen the money they have worked for. Women who have to beg to have a night out with their friends. You know, we are seeing that even though women are becoming more financially independent in the modern day, we still see those forms of coercion and control around money and finances. And of course, you know, spiritual abuse is one that's not talked about a lot. How people's faith, especially during a crisis, people turn to their faith and their spiritual life, you know, how that is utilized against them. That's how, you know, the Bible, for example, there's scriptures used that say a woman is meant to submit to her husband. Her body doesn't belong to her. So it can't be raped because your body belongs to your husband. Or how the, you know, the Quran is used to subjugate women and told what they can wear, where they can go. Or, in fact, all faith, I find to be patriarchal in nature and, very, and can be utilized and abused by perpetrators to control their partner. It's not the faith themselves that are the issue. It's the way they're utilized to control people. Mm. And I would like to add with those other types of violence, cultural abuse. I don't think we talk about cultural abuse, how one's cultural identity can be utilized against them to control them. Being told you're not African enough because you don't want to cook. Being told you, you know, you're not Asian enough because you're not submissive and you're not always looking down and bowing to everyone. How culture can be utilized to tell you that because you don't act in the traditional sense, you are not cultural enough. Or if your partner is not from that culture, that is then utilized against you or, you know, used to put you into a box. You know, like other African women, you're not like this type of woman, you're not like that person out there. So I think we have to be mindful that we're seeing more and more perpetrators come up with different modes of controlling their partner, subjugating women so that they can have that ultimate power. One type of abuse that really concerns me is technological abuse at the moment, because I think with the way technology is created and the way we have so much access and how easy it is to track people, we're seeing perpetrators become very smart, very, very smart. I know women who have custody arrangements with, with their ex-partners who have been abusive, who are putting secret cameras in teddy bears. In the little bag that the kid takes from one home to the next home, there's camera there or videos what, that are being utilized to record their movement, to record what is said or not said. That is very scary. These are women who have left. And even though they have left and removed themselves and their children out of those unsafe situations, they're still being harassed. They're still being monitored. They still feel unsafe. That's unacceptable. Absolutely unacceptable. Mm. Thank you, Khadija. Tarang, the research that underpins the campaign revealed a significant disparity between how uncommon Australians believe this abuse is and the distressing reality. Why is it so important to address this discrepancy? 
Thank you, Tiffany. It's so important that we address the discrepancy because non-physical forms of abuse and violence and all those forms of abuse that we've detailed, technological abuse, spiritual abuse, financial abuse, other forms of cultural abuse, the whole gamut of emotional and psychological abuse often, but not always, but often escalates into physical violence. Mm -hmm. So my little sister Nikita was murdered by her partner in the context of separation when she was just 23. And it wasn't like one day uh, he just snapped, as the media reported. It wasn't like one day he just decided that today was the day that her life was going to end and he was going to be the one responsible for it. It was an escalation of behaviours. It was an escalation of isolating her from her friends, uh, isolating her from us, her family. Uh, it was controlling the household finances. She was a primary breadwinner and yet she had no access to money. So she was living in her own home, um, effectively destitute. And these are the forms of behaviours and forms of abuse that we need to shine a light on. Uh, and COVID-19, as, as tragic as the public health uh, ramifications are, as tragic as the economic ramifications are and will be for some time, neither of those conditions excuse uh, this form of abuse and violence. Thank you, Terang. Rebecca, you have often spoken of your own experience of abuse and the abuse your sister and her children endured. Can you tell us about the difficulty of recognising or accepting that what you're experiencing is in fact abuse? Yeah, I think it's, it's great that now in the media and uh, we're seeing a lot more discussion around domestic and family violence, but what is happening in a lot of those stories is there's images that are accompanying those and a lot of the discussion is um, what you see is a man standing over a cowering woman with his fist raised or perhaps a poster with a woman with a black eye. And that sort of is connecting the dots that abuse is physical abuse. But the problem is, is that we have, you know, one in four women in this country who have experienced non-physical violent forms of abuse. So for example, with, um, my, with my sister's case with her partner that went on to kill um, her two children after she left him, she, all that she had up to that point was non-physical forms of abuse. And for us as a birth family, despite the fact that we all had a couple of degrees each and PhDs and masters, we never once thought that she was in an abusive relationship. We never once triggered that what she was in was a family violence situation. Uh, and that was because all, all our experience had been was seeing what's portrayed in the media or my stories, and that's a woman with a black eye. And he, my brother-in-law, had never hit my sister. And I've been in an abusive relationship myself, and the same thing happened. He never hit me. So to experience, um, to sort of like try to articulate why you feel so fearful, why you feel so humiliated, why you've ended up in this situation with such low self-worth, we need to look at what these non-physical forms of violence are. And it's looking at the pattern that occurs within relationships and this coercive control. And that's where someone else is exerting control over another person using um, techniques that degrade or humiliate or bring down their self-worth. So in the end, you have a perpetrator who is controlling the victim within that family home. Um, and there's often children that are in that situation as well, either witnessing it or seeing it. Mm. And so um, sort of naming what those non-physical forms of violence are is really, really important to educate people and just to see how deadly the consequences can be. But even when I was in my relationship, you know, and looking at what the examples of non-physical violence are as articulated really well, um, with Kadisha and Terang just there, it can be, you know, looking at the phone, um, saying, do you really want to be friends with that person? For example, my partner, you know, I would hardly get out the house. And when I did, he would constantly call, where are you when you're coming back home? And that was in that trying to isolate me. And even when I was in that situation, often when it's, a pattern, um, the, the, each individual incident may not seem like a lot. So I would pick up the phone to call the police because I was fearful and I was scared. And I'm like, what am I going to say? He's called me fat. You know, he's asking me to come home when I'm out. They'll say he's just concerned for me. It was really hard to articulate. Like, you know, so sometimes those acts don't, you know, individually sound that big. So it's really, really, really important to look at the pattern 
And those are what add up, those red flags each time. Those are what add up and can often result, um, have, you know, deadly result, like either if it doesn't result in a domestic homicide, you know, you are left with scars forever having um, lived through that experience. Uh, and I always like to quote, like in New South Wales, domestic um, a homicide review into domestic violence um, homicides. In 99% of those cases, the um, male perpetrators um, had coercive control over the female partners that ended up resulting in a domestic homicide. So these are not trivial things that are happening within a relationship. They cause terror, they cause degradation, they cause humiliation and they can be deadly for the women and children in that situation. And I also like to flag with the um, psychological and emotional abuse that we spoke about before that a really common technique is threatening abuse as well. So um, that I, I um, work a lot with police and one of the most common scenarios they see, it also happened in my relationship and my sister's relationship is the perpetrator threatens self-harm or suicide. So if you leave me, I will kill myself. And quite often the victim feels responsible for that perpetrator. Um, and the police often say they see it in around 70 to 80% of the cases that they will threaten, um, the perpetrator will threaten suicide if um, the victim attempts to leave. Mm. Really good points there, Beck. Thank you. Um, Khadija, you also speak as a survivor of violence. As a woman of colour, can you elaborate more on um, what you've experienced, the violence you've experienced, um, and also from a culturally and ling linguistically diverse women uh, being further excused, condoned and or ignored? Mm. Oh, thank you, Tiffany. I think what we have to realise is that, you know, when we think of the experiences of women, with domestic and family violence in Australia, we're not all starting from the state same um, plight, starting point, essentially. The layers of privilege and the layers of oppression and marginalization that different women experience. So as a woman who's come from refugee background, coming, uh, having lived in Australia for 19 years, what I know is that when I was growing up in my own community, you know, this idea that women needed to uh, be in the kitchen, cook, know your place. And I was constantly told while I was studying law and politics, what was the point of all that education when the goal should be to get married and that I needed to dumb myself down um, so that, you know, I wouldn't be a threat to a man because I shouldn't be, sound too smart. All that thousands of dollars I was spending on that education only to then dumb myself down so a man would not be threatened by me was really the message I got. And I remember constantly having this message of, around that, you know, any sort of violence or abuse against women was discipline. In fact, that's what it was called. I remember the amount of time people would come to my house, you know, my mom would be a mediator between a husband and a wife and all the community groups would gather together, the elders, and the conversations constantly were what she could do better, whether she should cook more, clean more, know her place more, show more respect to him. At no point did I hear in any of these conversations whether what he needed to do to change and how he needed to be held accountable and how he needed to respect her or maybe he should get into the kitchen and maybe learn how to cook a meal here and there you know what i mean or clean or contribute i didn't hear that it was constantly one-sided it, it, it in fact there is a saying in my language the the success of a marriage depends on the success or a failure of a marriage depends on a woman what do you think is wrong with that sentence the success or failure of a marriage depends on the woman if it doesn't work, it's your fault. If it works, it's your fault. Essentially, it's all coming down to you, the woman. What you can take is what I got out of it. That every time all my aunties got together, all these conversations happened around domestic and family violence. The conversation, the focus on what those women could do to keep their marriages together, their relationship together. And in essence, because they were all there because they were being abused, what everyone is saying is, how much more can you take? You need to take much more and know your place much more. And that will be the success of this relationship. If it fails, it's because you dare to think you are special, which it was my case. I was told I thought I was special by calling the police on my ex. That I thought I was so special to think that I deserved to be in a home, to have rights where I was safe and felt like I could be myself and not have to dumb myself or watch what I say or not, or not be free to express myself as a human or have freedom of movement the way I saw fit that was not actually accepted. And when I called the police and decided to take action, I was told by a police officer that the men in my community were just inherently more violent than everyone else. I was like, excuse, 
excuse me? Oh, young men, aren't they just more violent? Actually, they're not. There's no research to back that up. Men of all cultures can be violent. Men of all cultures perpetrate domestic and family violence. I'm racializing this right now. You're isolating me. But that's my identity. I'm African. You're, you're in, telling me I inherently come from a culture that's more violent. That's actually not true. But right now, you're being racist. And that doesn't help me in this situation where I've come to you despite the argument and the persuasion of everyone in my community who said that Australia is racist. Do you think they're going to protect you? You're a black woman. Why would they protect you? Why would they support you? And then I go to the station to make a report and what do I get? So what we find is that marginalized women and women of color in Australia from refugee, migrant background, we constantly copy from both sides. Our communities may not support us in standing against domestic and family violence. In fact, they may condone the violence perpetrated against us because of cultural values around gender roles and knowing our place. Then when we do access services and support in the Australian system, we then face racism. It's like being stuck between a rock and a hard place. We actually not safe either way and we can't win either way. So you're then left ostracized and pushed against the margin with no support available to you trying to keep safe. We see even with the media, when women of color have been killed, where was the outrage? The outrage is not even equal. Who gets more attention? Who gets, who gets the vigils? Who gets an outcry? We don't see that. And I need to say that we do understand that I am privileged as an African Australian woman living on stolen land where First Nation women are predominantly killed and have higher rates of different experiences. And they don't get an outcry. They don't get the vigils either. We see an inequality across the spectrum, and I think that needs to be acknowledged. As we have this conversation, we must acknowledge some women have it harder. They have extra challenges that they have to face. We're not being treated equally, whether in terms of domestic and family violence or accessing service and the way our, our pain or our suffering is received. And that is actually quite unfortunate. Because at the end of the day, when I work with women and girls in my community, I want to feel confident when I tell them that the abuse that's happening to them is unacceptable. I want to feel like when I then tell them to ask for help, that they get the help they deserve and they're not further marginalized or punished by the system or by a, a, by a society that says that we are inherently more violent or we are just inherently more deserving of that violence because it's part of our culture when there's nothing to say that is true whatsoever. Thank you, Khadija. It's definitely uh, an insight and, uh, that we absolutely have to acknowledge, uh, have to take into account when we're looking at this overall. Um, Tarang, your sister Nikki, as you said, was murdered in the context of separation. You spoke about how she experienced a number of forms of non-physical violence um, and how that violence then escalated. In your advocacy, no doubt you've heard men say, but I would never hit a woman. How do you respond and how can we respond to that? Thanks, Tiffany. I hear that a lot. I hear a lot of men say to me, uh, but I don't hit a woman or I would never hit a woman. You know, when we have a conversation about gendered violence, or we have a conversation about gender inequality or rigid gender roles and stereotypes informing the kinds of opportunities that are then later afforded to women and men in society. They often say things uh, along those lines. Well, you know, I've never hit a woman. I never would. Uh, but they will use put downs, they will use uh, emotional abuse, or they will see that there's no problem in checking her phone or controlling the household finances. And a lot of this has its basis in the power and control of gender inequality. So it's gender inequality as one of the drivers of violence against women, but then all the, also the power and control. And a lot of men in these situations will see that there's nothing wrong with their behaviour simply because they're not using physical violence. And I often say to them, well, that's a good start, but wouldn't you want to live in the society? Wouldn't you want to be the type of man that doesn't condone or excuse any form of violence? And obviously they do want to aspire to that. So I think that in terms of uh, our understanding of masculinity, our understanding of Australian men, it's about being aspirational. It's about being uh, you know, a better type of man and a, and a more holistic type of masculinity. Uh, and obviously the, the health benefits for men are well documented, but women live uh, around men and with us. And often, particularly during COVID-19, we're seeing the brunt of um, a lot of these inequalities surface 
You know, we're seeing the rise in women's domestic labour and duties. We're seeing the rise in emotional labour that women occupy. We're seeing women take greater responsibility for caring for children. And all of those exist as part of the society that we occupy, which tells women that their place is on the one hand and men's place is on the other. And now that we're seeing so many shifts in society, my hope is that we can start to have conversations that do not excuse any form of abuse and violence mm -hmm. and starts to see men aspiring to be better. Mm, absolutely. Thank you, Tereen. Before we close, Natasha, um, in summary, I want to hand it to you on the back of uh, obviously everything that we've heard this afternoon. Thank you, Tiffany. And you've heard from some extraordinary, powerful, brave advocates here. Um, Khadija's point is an important one. Of course, any response to these matters must be intersectional. Not every woman experiences gender inequality in the same way. We know that different disadvantage and discrimination intersect, whether it's colonisation, racism, transphobia, ableism, all homophobia, many other discriminations and disadvantage intersect to make the experience different or more severe. We must remember in these difficult times that just because there is stress and tension being exacerbated, that does not excuse this violence. And indeed, it is not the cause of this violence. It may exacerbate the drivers of violence in the first place, which we know, Tiffany, are the issue of disrespect. And of course, as you've heard from Tarang, some of those attitudes and behaviours that give rise to this violence in the first place. We need to challenge gender inequality and all the other inequalities in our society. But if we do not start to call out bad behaviour, if we don't call out and recognise and challenge comments, behaviours and all these myriad forms of violence to which we refer today, then we won't prevent it. But on the good news side, Tiffany, we know that this is not an inherent part of the biological condition. We know it's preventable and we will prevent violence against women and their children, but we've got to do it together. Mm. Thank you, Natasha. Khadija, Rebecca, Tarang, uh, thank you for your contribution to this uh, incredibly important topic um, and to everyone for joining us today. We encourage you all to visit noexcuseforabuse.org.au to find out the steps that you can take to help. And may we remind you once again that help is available for everyone. If you or someone you know is experiencing any kind of abuse, you can contact 1800 RESPECT. If you are worried about your own behaviour, you can contact Men's Line. And of course, if you, a child or another person is in immediate danger, please dial triple zero. And thank you once again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.